this tape we're going to be looking at um, both tiles rule, which, which gives you a method for evaluating limits, and improper integrals, which use various limits to extend the idea of the integral. Um, we're going to talk first of all about indeterminate forms. These are forms where it's very difficult to determine the limits of a particular function. Right? In particular here, um, L'Hopital's rule is going to apply in two cases. One is where you're looking at f of x over g of x. And as you want the limit, as x approaches the number a, and f of x goes to 0, and g of x goes to 0. This is going to be the form 0 over 0. And in general, it's not easy to determine what the limit is going to be in this case here. Um, an example is the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x. Right. Now you may know that this limit is equal to 1 from other considerations. However, L'Hopital's rule will allow you to get it easily. Right. Um, another situation is, is that you're looking at the limit as x approaches a of f of x over g of x, and the numerator goes to infinity, and the denominator goes to infinity. Well, what you're dealing with here, then, you can't really tell. The situation actually is that this is plus or minus infinity, and this is plus or minus infinity. It's not easy to tell what's going to happen here. An example that you should know is the limit as, let's say, x approaches. And uh, here, the number a can be plus or minus infinity also. So that, for example, as x approaches a, of, let's say, 2x squared plus 7 over x squared plus 1. Now, you may know from other considerations that this limit is equal to 2. L'Hopital's rule will allow you to get it easily. It will also allow you to get, get a number of limits where you couldn't possibly tell um, what the limit was going to be. What L'Hopital's rule says is the following, that under these circumstances, here with 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity, is if you've got a quotient like this, instead of looking at the quotient, in most circumstances, you can look at, instead, the derivative of the numerator divided by the derivative of the denominator. And the limits are going to be the same. That's to say, this limit is going to be the limit as x approaches 0 of the derivative of the numerator, cosine x, divided by the derivative of the denominator, which is 1. And now as x approaches 0, cosine x approaches 1, so that the limit is going to be equal to 1. Similarly here, L'Hopital's rule says that you, if, when you've got infinity over infinity, with either plus and minus infinity over plus or minus infinity, instead of looking at the limit of the quotient of the two functions, you look at the limit of the quotient of the derivatives, and if it exists, it's going to be the limit of the quotient of the functions. So this then should be the limit as x approaches infinity of um, 4x over 2x, which of course is 4 over 2, which is equal to 2. Right? Now you see this normally by looking at the limit as x approaches infinity, divide numerator divided by x squared, and we get 2 plus 7 over x squared, divided by 1 plus 1 over x squared, and 7 over x squared, 1 over x squared, go to 0, and so we end up with 2 over 1. So you could do this normally without using L'Hopital's rule. However, by using L'Hopital's rule, you could get that this limit is equal to 2. And one could also use L'Hopital's rule more than once if it applies. Here, for example, We've got 4x over 2x. As x approaches infinity, the numerator approaches infinity, as does the denominator. So L'Hopital's rule is going to apply here. That's to say this is going to be a limit as x approaches infinity. The derivative of the numerator is 4, the derivative of the denominator is 2. So again, we get 2 for the limits. Okay, these are the determinate, indeterminate forms for which L'Hopital's rule applies. 0 over 0, plus or minus infinity, or plus or minus infinity. There are also some others which we're going to want to, to reduce to limits of this form, or sometimes work with until we can either find the limit or get L'Hopital's rules to work with them. One of these indeterminate forms is 0 over 0, or I'm sorry, is 0 to the 0 power. For example, the limit as x approaches 0 on the right of x to the x power. Right? Well, any number to the 0 power is 1, but 0 to any power is equal to 0. And so you could expect anything in between 0 and 1, and perhaps even some other combination here, uh, 
uh, some other number to be this limit, or perhaps no limits. So this is an indeterminate form of the, of the type, zero to the zero power. We'll see how to deal with that also. Um, one to the infinity is a, is a, is a particular form here. Um, an example of the limit as x approaches zero on the right, let's say, of uh, one plus x to the one over x. Right? As x approaches zero, this approaches one. We're dealing with one to a large power. But what what happens here when you take a number, take a number to a very large power, you tend to get a large number. On the other hand, if you take one to a large power, you get one. So what's going to happen with this limit? You can't just tell by observing it. Um, a third, infinity to the zero. For example, 1 over x to the x squared power. Limit as x approaches, let's say, 0 from the right. What happens to this? Well, we get plus infinity here to the 0 power. Right? When you take a large number to the 0 power, or to a power that's close to 0, you get something close to 1, or you get something very large when you're looking at large numbers to a power. You can't tell by simply looking at it. So, here, then, are three other indeterminate forms. Um, and the fourth one here is infinity minus infinity. Right? When you've got a large number, you subtract another large number, you can't tell quite what's happening. An example would be 1 over x minus cotangent x. Limit as x approaches 0 on the right, let's say. Right? What happens to this? You can't tell. It's of this form. These are not easily reduced to low potential effect. Sometimes you need to do something else with them. But anyway, here's an example of a limit of that form. I want to state low potential rule, and then we'll look at what's needed to show that low potential rule actually holds. So here's here's here are the, here's a statement of low potential rule. Suppose um, so this is low potential rule. approaches A on the right, but it's equally valid for B on the left, or so that it, and it's also consequently valid for, for the two-sided limits. And the limit as X approaches A on the right of G of X, if both these limits are equal to zero, right, or if the limit as x approaches a on the right of g of x is infinity, and minus infinity is also a possibility here. The rule also applies then. And the limit as x approaches a on the right of f prime of x over g prime of x is capital A, and capital A can also be plus or minus infinity. The conclusion is that then the limit as x approaches a on the right of f of x over g of x is also equal to capital A. That's to say, if you can find the value of the limit of f of x over g of x, by looking at the limit of the quotient of the derivatives f prime and g. And now, if this goes to see if you get a zero over zero situation here or infinity over infinity situation, then you can apply the 
this a second time, look at the limit of the second derivatives, or third, fourth, fifth, and so forth time. And sometimes quite a few applications of L'Hopital's rule are necessary to define the limits easily of the quotient of the two functions. So here's L'Hopital's rule. Here's some examples of some indeterminate forms. prime of z is equal to g of b minus g of a times f prime of z. Right. There's a little more to this, which is needed for what the will. Further, if g prime of x is never equal to zero, Let's consider the, the, the function h of x. It's going to be equal to um, f of b minus f of a times g of x. It's the same as this, except this replaced with g of x minus this side over here, g of b minus g of a times f of x. So we want to consider this function like so. And now, what I want to show first of all is that h of a and h of b are equal. So let's look at what h of a is. Well, if I put a in here for x, I get f of b times g of a minus f of a times g of a minus g of b f of a a in for x, and I get plus g of a f of a. Okay. Now, this g of b, g of, f of b, g of a, um, I'm sorry, these, th this term right here is the negative of this one right here. So 
two terms that I've underlined, I'm going to add up to zero. I can treat them as if they're not there in, in showing this equality. Let's look at h of b. h of b is f of b minus f of a times g of b. I guess multiplying this out. So times g of b. So f of b times g of b minus f of a times g of b minus g of b f of b. function h is 0. Either the function is constant, in which case any point will do, or if the derivative is going to be 0 at a maximum, or if the function doesn't take on its maximum on the interval, then the, zero, the derivative is going to be 0 at a minimum. So there is a point z, z so that h of z is equal to 0. But what's h of z? I'm sorry, so that h prime of z is equal to 0. But what's h prime of z? Well, it's this times the derivative of g, minus this times the derivative of f. So that's to say it's equal to f of b minus f of a times the derivative of g minus g of b minus g of a times the derivative of f at c. Well, that says that this times the derivative of g at z is equal to this times the derivative of f at z. So we've got the first part of the theorem here. Now, if g prime is not 0 on a, b, then g prime is either greater than 0 or is less than 0, and g is either increasing or decreasing. And so that says that g of b is not equal to g of a, and g prime of z is not equal to 0. So I can divide both sides of this equation by g of b minus g of a, and I can also divide both, both of them by g prime of z, and that's going to get me f of b minus f of a over g of b minus g of a is equal to f prime of z over g prime of z. And so we now have this right here holding also. So that is the proof of um, Cauchy's mean value theorem. And we just completed it and showed that this holds right here for some point z between a and b. as 
of x approaches a on the right of f prime of x over g prime of x is equal to a, possibly plus or minus infinity, or some number, then the limit as x approaches a on the right, or on the left if it's b, if it's a number on the left, of f of x over g of x is also equal to a. The second part of the statement is this. If the limit as x approaches a on the right of g of x is equal to infinity, or minus infinity, Let's look at what happens here. Let's suppose that the limit as x approaches a to the right of f of x is the limit as x approaches g of a to the right of g of x is equal to 0. And let's suppose that a is some finite number. If a is minus infinity, it's a different story. So let's define f of a to be equal to g of a to be equal to 0. Right. So that now, if we do this, then f and g are continuous on the right at a. Okay. So they're going to be continuous on the right at some interval from, from a. They're going to be continuous on the right, they're going to be continuous on some interval a to a plus epsilon. Right. Um, Cauchy's mean value theorem says the following. Namely that there is a point z between x and a. So f of x minus f of a over g of x minus g of a is equal to the derivative of f at this point z divided by the derivative of g at this point z. Now I'm going to write z sub x here because this point z depends on x. And notice that this, if f of a is 0 and g of a is equal to 0, this is nothing but f of x over g of x. Now our hypothesis say here that f prime over g prime approaches the cap number capital A, so that as x approaches A on the right, this approaches capital A. This quantity right here approaches capital A, and so consequently f of x over g of x must approach capital A. So that basically proves this part of the theorem here, where A is a finite number. Right? And the limit as you approach A on the right of f g on the right is 0. Similar if, this, if we go to b on the left, or if we go to a number on the left, um, a similar situation holds here. Right? If the limit is infinity for g, right? and then in general the limit for f will be either plus or minus infinity, right? then if the derivatives have a limit, then so will the ratio of the functions have the same limits. Right? Not only that, this can be, if, if, you, if this is done for f divided by g, and you get an improper form here, let's say 0 over 0. So you look at f prime over g prime. If you get an improper form again, 0 over 0, for example, you can look at this again for the second derivative. Right? Until such time, perhaps, as you find out, can you determine what the limit of the quotient is. If you get 0 over 0 here, 0 over 0 here, you can apply this several times. We'll see that um, as we do some examples. There's low Patel's rule and a proof of part of it, namely part of part one. We're going to first look at some examples that can be calculated with low Patel's rule, but can also be calculated relatively easy without. And you can see what happens here. Now, when, they, when something can be calculated without is low Patel's rule, it's not necessarily simple to use low Patel's rule. Usually it's not much more difficult, though. Let's take a look at the limit as x approaches 2. 
2 of x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. Right. Here the numerator and uh, goes to 0, and the denominator goes to 0 as x approaches 2. And so both Tau's rule applies here. Um, and so we can take the derivative. Um, the de the, de uh, the uh, derivative of the numerator and, and get 2x, and the derivative of the denominator and get 1, and take the limit as x approaches 2 of this. And so we're going to get 4 for the limit. Now, if we wanted to do this without L'Hopital's rule, what we would do is we would write this as the limit as x approaches 2. The numerator can be factored into x minus 2 times x plus 2. The denominator is x minus 2. And now, as long as x is not equal to 2, which it's not when we're taking the limit, we get that this is the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 2, which again is going to be equal to 4. Right? So this is an example of, of a situation where you can use L'Hopital's rule. It's just about as easy to factor this and find out what the limit is. Um, that's going to be this, the case for, for each of these here now. So the limit as x approaches infinity of 7x plus 5 over 2x minus 3. Right? Um, L'Hopital's rule applies here. The numerator approaches infinity, the denominator approaches infinity. So we can determine by L'Hopital's rule that this is the limit as x approaches infinity of 7 over 2, which is 7 halves. So if we were just doing this directly, we would derive, divide numerator and denominator by x. We would have the limit as x approaches infinity of 7 plus 5 over x divided by 2 minus 3 over x. And you would note that these two quantities I've circled here were 0 as x approaches infinity, and so the limit is going to be 7 halves. Look at the limit as x approaches infinity of 4 minus 3x squared over 2x plus 2x squared. Right. Um, the numerator approaches what, minus infinity. The denominator approaches plus infinity here. And so L'Hopital's rule applies. So we can find this is the limit as x approaches infinity. Taking the derivative of the numerator, we get minus 6x. The derivative of the denominator is 2 plus 4x. Again now, the numerator approaches in minus infinity, the denominator approaches infinity, so we can apply L'Hopital's rule a second time, and get that this is the limit as x approaches infinity of minus 6 over 4, which is minus 3 halves. If we've done this without L'Hopital's rule, what we would do is we would look at the limit as x approaches infinity, Divide the numerator denominated by x squared, we get 4 over x squared minus 3 divided by 2 over x plus 2. And now as x approaches infinity, this approaches 0 and this approaches 0, so we get minus 3 halves to the limit. Thank you. 
times 8 is the limit in the numerator, so this limit is going to be equal to 8. Okay? I mean, it's not easy to see that that would be the limit from observing e to the 8x minus 1 over x. But the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x squared over x. Um, the numerator approaches 0, the denominator approaches 0, so the Tau's rule applies here. So if we differentiate the numerator and the denominator, we get the limit as x approaches 0. Um, the derivative of the numerator this is cosine of x squared times the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. In the denominator, we get 1. Right? Now, as x approaches 0, Cosine of x squared goes to 1, 2x goes to 0, so this limit is equal to 0. Right. How about the limit? As x approaches 0, let's go from the right. Cosine of the square root of x, 1 minus cosine square root of x over x. Square root of x approaches 0, cosine of it approaches 1, so the numerator here approaches 0, denominator approaches 0, so the Tau's rule applies. You can now differentiate the numerator and the denominator. And the numerator we're going to get here minus the derivative of cosine of square root of x is um, minus the sine, so plus sine square root of x times the derivative of the square root of x, which is 1 half x to the minus 1 half. Okay, now as x approaches 0, sine square root of x goes to 0. This is 1 over the square root of x, and so it goes to uh, infinity. Um, I really want to deal with this in the following fashion. We want to rewrite this as, so that we can use L'Hopital's rule on it, sine of square root of x times 1 half or over 2 square root of x. And the limit now as x approaches 0 on the right. Now the numerator approaches 0, the denominator approaches 0, and so we can apply L'Hopital's rule to it. If this limit exists, then so will this one. If the limit, when we take the derivative here, exists, then all three of these will exist, they'll be the same. Limit is x approaches 0 on the right, take the derivative, sine of square root of x, so it's going to be cosine of square root of x times derivative of square root of x, one half x to the minus one half, divided by the derivative of the denominator, which is two times one half x to the minus one half. Yes? You can cancel that one half x to the minus one half here, and as x approaches zero from the right now, um, cosine x goes to one, cosine square root of x goes to zero, cosine of zero is, is one, and so this is going to be equal to one half. Right? Now, beware. Huh? You always want to make sure that you're dealing with, with zero over zero or infinity over infinity to apply L'Hopital's rule. For example, we looked at the limit as x approaches one of x minus one over sine x. L'Hopital's rule does not apply here. The numerator approaches zero, the denominator approaches sine of 1, whatever that is, and so that this limit is equal to 0. Right? If, you, if instead you had taken the numerator and differentiated it, and likewise the denominator, we would get 1 over cosine x, and as x approaches 1, this is going to be 1 over cosine 1, whatever cosine of, of the angle, which is 1 radian is, it's not 0. And so, this is the proper limit here. Um, you need 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity in order to apply L'Hopital's rule. So here are some initial examples. We're going to take a look at some more examples of L'Hopital's rule. Let's look at the limit x approaches infinity of pi over 2 minus tangent inverse of x over uh, 1 over x. Right. Recall that the tangent inverse function looks like this. Right. And as x approaches infinity, there's a limit of pi over 
that part of the tangent function has been used for this, and so pi over 2 is the limit. So we get 0 over 0 here as x approaches infinity, and so L'Hopital's rule applies here. And we get this the limit as x approaches infinity of minus 1 over 1 plus x squared. That's the derivative of the numerator. And now what derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared. This is equals to the limit as x approaches infinity of x squared over 1 plus x squared. Now you can either divide the numerator denominator by x squared or notice that this limit is equal to 1. Well, the Lopetal's rule actually applies here. And so you can write that this is the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x over 2x. Now that's clearly equal to 1. But actually, Lopetal's rule could be applied here if you wanted to. And you can write that this is the limit as x approaches infinity. 2 over 2, which of course is 1. Right. So this, this limit is equal to 1. Let's look at another. The limit as x approaches infinity of log of x divided by x to the 1 third. So as x approaches infinity, the numerator approaches infinity, and the denominator approaches infinity. So L'Hopital's rule applies here. And this is the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x divided by 1 third x to the minus 2 thirds, which is equal to the limit as x approaches infinity. This is x to the minus 2 thirds, or 1 over x to the 2 thirds. So we're going to get 3 here. And then I'm inverting this, we're going to have x to the 2 thirds over x. So this is 1 over x to the 1 third. And as x approaches infinity, this approaches 0. But notice that we could have also done this with instead of x to the 1 third, if we took any the nth, any nth root of x, the logarithm of x goes to infinity slower than the nth root x to the 1 over n. Because we're going to get for this limit, the L'Hopital's rule applies. This is the limit as x approaches infinity, 1 over x, 1 over n x to the 1 over n minus 1, which is going to be equal to the limit as x approaches infinity. We get an n, right? And then we've got x to the 1 over n minus 1, okay? And that this is, this consequently is going to be equal to 1 over x right, divided by x to the 1 over n minus 1. So we want to subtract. No. 1 over x times x times x to the 1 over n minus 1. So this is 1 over x to the 1 over n. 1 minus um, 1 plus 1 over n minus 1, or 1 over n. And now as x approaches infinity, x to the 1 over n goes to 0. n is a fixed number here, so this limit is equal to 0. So the logarithm goes to infinity slower than the nth root, no matter how big n is. Let's look at a similar situation for the exponents. So the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the x over x cubed. L'Hopital's rule applies to the limit of the numerator is infinity, the limit of the denominator is infinity, so that we can take the derivatives here and look at what their limits. Look, this is the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the x over 3x squared. Again, L'Hopital's rule applies infinity over infinity. This is the limit then as x approaches infinity of e to the x over 6x. Again, L'Hopital's rule. Limit as x approaches infinity of e to the x over 6, which is going to be infinity. So here we've applied L'Hopital's rule one, two, three times here. And it's clear that if we looked at the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the x over x to some power, after applying L'Hopital's rule n times here, we would be looking at e to the x over n factorial. The limit as x approaches infinity. When we apply it, both tells rule 1, we're going to get n times x to the n minus 1, then we're going to have n times n minus 1, and so forth here. We're going to end up with e to the x 
over to n factorial. n factorial is a fixed number, though. And as x approaches infinity, this is going to be equal to infinity. So the e to the x goes to infinity faster than any power of x as x approaches infinity. In the sense that the ratio goes to infinity also. So more examples of Philip Thomas rule. Here's x approaches 0. Well, secant x is 1 over the cosine. So the numerator approaches, approaches 0, and the denominator approaches 0. And so that this is going to be equal to 2. The limit is x approaches 0. And the denominator here we get 6x. And the numerator here we get 0 minus 2 secant x times the derivative of secant x, which is secant x tangent x. We have 2 secant squared tangent x. Tangent x approaches 0 as x approaches 0. And so we've got 0 again here. So we can if, use apply L'Hopital's rule one more time. We get the limit as x approaches 0. 6 we get the denominator. We now have minus 2. The numerator is a product. So the derivative is the first secant squared. That's the derivative of the second, which is Derivative tangent is secant, so this is secant to the fourth. Derivative tangent is secant squared, so we have secant squared times secant squared is secant to the fourth. Plus the second tangent times the derivative of secant squared. Derivative of secant squared is 2 secant x to the first times the derivative of secant x, which is secant tangent. So all together we get secant squared tangent. So there's the numerator. Now what happens here? Well, as x approaches 0, the tangent approaches 0, but the secant approaches 1. So the numerator approaches minus 2, the denominator approaches 6, so we get minus 1 third, 2 sixths, minus 2 sixths, and minus a third for this limit. Let's take a look at one that we can do. Elsewise, x cubed minus 8 over x to the fourth minus 16, as x approaches 2. Now you know that as x, x approaches 2, you, that since the numerator goes to 0, the denominator goes to 0, x minus 2 can be factored out of the numerator, and it can also be factored out of the denominator. But watch what happens with the Pitales rule here. You don't need to do that. This is the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x squared over 4x cubed, which is equal to 2. As x approaches 2, we're not dealing with 0 over 0 here anymore. But the numerator is going to approach um, 12, and the denominator is going to approach 8. This is 2 cubed times 4 is 32. Right. 4 times 3, or 12, over 32, or 6 sixteenths, or 3 eighths. Right. You don't want to apply L'Hopital's rule at this, at this stage right here, because there is no 0 over 0. Let's take a look at another such instance where you really should be careful. You should be aware of here. Let's suppose we look at x plus sine x over x plus cosine x. We want to live it as x approaches infinity. Now the thing to note here is that the denominator x plus cosine x, the derivative of this is zero infinitely often. When cosine x is, if we, if we differentiate the denominator here, we get um, 1, what? The derivative of cosine x is minus the sine x. So the derivative of the denominator is 0 infinitely often. And so L'Hopital's rule, rule does not apply here. Um, if we look at 1 plus cosine x over 1 plus sine x, we'll find that this limit doesn't exist. 
this does not have the limits anyway. But the fact that the derivative has got the denominator has got derivative, which is zero infinitely often, means that you cannot use this use L'Hopital's rule to apply this to, to find the limits. Here, in this case right here, if we divide the numerator and denominator by x, we get that the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 plus sine x over x divided by 1 plus cosine x over x is going to be equal to 1 because both of these terms that I'm circling here approach 0. But L'Hopital's rule does not apply it. Beware of using L'Hopital's rule in this case right here. That's in fact, if, it, if instead of x plus cosine x in the denominator here, we had 2x plus cosine x, so we have x plus sine x over 2x plus cosine x, and let the limit as x approaches infinity of this, L'Hopital's rule applies here, but you've got to be aware of something. That's to say, this is equal to the limit as x approaches infinity, and the numerator we get 1 plus cosine x, and the denominator here we get 2 minus sine x, so that the denominator, the derivative of the denominator is never equal to 0, but now the thing to note here is that the derivative of the, the, the quotient of these derivatives does not have a limit. So even though you can't apply a L'Hopital's rule and differentiate numerator and denominator, when you do so, there's no limit to the derivative here. So you can't compute the limits of this quantity right here using L'Hopital's rule because quotient of the derivatives do not have a limit. Again here, if we divide numerator and denominator by x, we get that this limit is equal to 1 half. But you can't tell it from this. Okay, so several things to be aware of. Make sure you have 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Right? Usually you don't have to check this, but make sure that the derivative, when if you differentiate numerator and denominator, the derivative is not zero infinitely often near the point you're approaching, in this case infinity. Right? And then even if it if it's not, you have got to make sure that it actually does have the quotient of the derivatives does have a limit. There's no limit. And L'Hopital's rule doesn't tell you anything. This can have a limit without the derivatives having a limit. But anyway, a couple of additional examples of L'Hopital's rule. A couple of things to watch out for so that you don't misuse it. solves a number of problems. Uh, sometimes you find yourself in a trap where it doesn't seem to be working with it, really, then it's a good idea to try something else. Let's take a look at an example of that. So we want to take a look at the limit as x approaches infinity of square root x squared plus 7 over x. Well, as x approaches infinity, the numerator approaches infinity, the denominator approaches infinity. So you might try a little problem rule on this. In which case, we have the limit as x approaches infinity the derivative of the numerator. 1 half x squared plus 7 to the minus 1 half times 2x. The derivative of the denominator is 1. Okay? The 2 and the half here cancel. And what we're looking at here then is that this is equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of we get x over square root x squared plus Right. And now if you've tried L'Hopital's rule, out, what happened here, we started with this, with this in the numerator, this in the denominator, we applied L'Hopital's rule and they reversed places. If we apply it again, they'll reverse places again here. And so L'Hopital's rule applied over and over again, we'll just reverse between these two quotients and you will not be able to find the limits. Right. Here, you, want, you don't want to continue doing this, you want to use um, back to the original quantity that you want to take the limit of, and notice that this is the limit as x approaches infinity of the square root x squared plus 7 over x squared. And now since the square root is continuous, we're going to bring the limit inside here, the quantity inside, so that this is equal to the square root limit as x approaches infinity, x squared plus 7 over x squared. You can either recognize this as having 
one first limit, or here you can apply a little Patel's rule and get this is the square root of the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x over 2x. So now it's clear that this is the square root of 1 or 1. Right? So although Patel's rule it may result in things that repeat, or even sometimes in things that get worse. Let's look at this situation. So you want to limit as x approaches infinity of square root x squared plus 7 over 3x plus the square root x squared plus 4. Right? Well, repeated applications of low Patel's rule here is going to make the situation worse. And uh, um, you're perhaps better off applying something else. In this case here, I guess I'd like to look at this as, and say, well, let's look at the reciprocal of this rather than this. If we look at f of x over g of x, this limit as x approaches a is going to be 1 over the limit as x approaches a of g of x over f of x, providing we're not talking about 1 over 0. All right. um, and what happens here? If we look at 1 over the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x over square root x squared plus 7, um, taking the reciprocal of this, and then we've got square root of x squared plus 4 over x squared plus 7. This is what? This is going to approach 1, and this, if we bring this inside the square root here, we're going to approach the square root of 9, so that all together here we get 1 over 3 and 1 is 4. So L'Hopital's rule here doesn't work as well, and sometimes you need to adjust things to get it so that to get things so that L'Hopital's rule um, will be useful. Right? So here are some examples where where you're best off not just applying L'Hopital's rule blindly. In this case here, you just go back and forth. Here things will get worse, and you can um, simplify things algebraically first, or even get the limit. some other indeterminate forms now, 0 to the infinity, 1 to the infinity, infinity to the 0, and see how you can um, rearrange these so that L'Hopital's rule uh, can be used on them. Suppose we've got more than this um, x approaches a of f of x to the g of x power, or for that matter, absolute f of x to the g of x power. Um, this could be transformed to the limit as x approaches a, take the logarithm of this and an exponent of that so that this is e to the logarithm of f of x to the g of x. And so we've got e to the log absolute f of x to the g of x. We can do the g of x outside the logarithm here like so. But, and now since the exponent is a continuous function, we can write this as e to the limit as x approaches a of g of x log absolute f of x. Now, let's look at what happens here. Suppose we were dealing with 0 to the 0 power here. Right? f of x approaches 0 and g of x approaches 0. And what we're looking at over here is 0 log f of x as x approaches um, a, f of x approaches 0, so we're looking at log of 0, so we're looking at 0 times infinity. So this becomes actually 0 times minus infinity. Right? And you can rewrite, the, rewrite this as log absolute f of x divided by 1 over g of x, for example, and the limit as x approaches a, and now e to that. Right? In which case now, as x approaches a, the numerator here approaches minus infinity, the g of x approaches 0, so the denominator approaches perhaps plus infinity, and we're looking at the case infinity over infinity here. 
in general, if you're looking at zero times infinity, you can you can rearrange this very easily by looking at one divided by the reciprocal of the other and be looking at infinity over infinity. So that using e to the log transforms this into a problem which involves L'Hopital's rule, or at least the form for L'Hopital's rule, of infinity over infinity. If we start with 1 to the infinity, then if, if as x approaches a, if g of x approaches um, infinity, and f of x approaches 1, then log of 1 is 0. We're looking at 0 times infinity here again, okay? which again can be transformed in this fashion here. If f of x approaches 1, log of 1 approaches 0, 1 over g of x as x approaches infinity approaches 0. So this is transformed then into 0 over 0 by making this change here. If we were looking at infinity to the 0, then what happens here? f of x approaches infinity, g of x approaches 0, log f of x is infinity, 1 over g of x gets very large, so looking at infinity over infinity case, this becomes the infinity over infinity case here. And in each of these cases, like after the transformation, L'Hopital's rule can be applied. Let's look at a specific example. Let's look at the limit as x approaches 0 on the right of x to the x. Okay? This is equal to, now what we want to do with this is we want to take logarithm followed by exponent. So we get that this is equal to the limit as x approaches 0 on the right of e to the log of x to the x, which is e to the x log x. e to the log of x to the x becomes e to the x log x. Right? And now this is equal to the limit as x approaches 0 on the right. We can bring the limit inside the exponent. So e to the limit of x log x. Right? Now what happens? This approaches 0. And, and this approach is by this infinity. So we're looking at that situation here. We can always then rewrite this as e again to the limit as x approaches 0 on the right, log x divided by 1 over x. When you have 0 times infinity, you can always rewrite it by taking the reciprocal of 1 of them and you end up with 0 over 0, or infinity over infinity. In this case, infinity over infinity. Now L'Hopital's rule applies to this limit right here. This is e to the limit as x approaches 0 on the right of 1 over x, derivative of log x, derivative of 1, 1 over x minus 1 over x squared, right? which is equal to e to the limit as x approaches 0 on the right. What have we got here? Minus x, which is e to the 0, or 1. So here we've used Exponent followed by logarithm to change this problem into one that involves L'Hopital's rule. Um, let's take a look at another situation here. If, we, if you're looking at something that's of the form zero times infinity, you can use this. You can use the same technique we've used partially here on something of the form zero times infinity. For example, let's suppose we want to look at the limit as x approaches zero of x cotangent x. Well, x approaches 0, let's say on the right. Cotangent x approaches infinity. Huh? So we can rewrite this as the limit as x approaches 0, let's say on the right here, of cotangent x over 1 over x. All right. Now we're looking at both the tunnels rule here, infinity over infinity. Huh? So Apply L'Hopital's rule, and we get that this is the limit as x approaches 0 on the right. The derivative of cotangent is minus cosecant squared. Minus cosecant squared of x. The derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared. So we get that this is equal to x squared, the minus signs cancel. Changing this to, to Sine, cosecant is 1 over sine, so this is x squared over sine squared x, the limit as x approaches 0 on the right. 
Now here, um, while well, you could apply local tunnels rule here, the thing to notice is that sine x over x approaches one. So that this uh, this is is x over sine x that's going to approach one times x over sine x, and so this limit is equal to one. So here we can observe through the fact that sine x over x as x approaches zero is one. This is going to approach one. So zero times infinity, and in this case here, zero to the zero and out to solve the problem using exponent of logarithm of the given function. And then we'll put out rule. Okay, I want to take a look at some other examples here of the form zero to the infinity, one to the infinity, infinity to the zero. As x approaches infinity, 1 plus 1 over x to the x. Right. Well, as x approaches infinity, this, pro this approaches 1. And x approaches infinity, so this is the form 1 to the infinity. Right. Um, we write this as e to the log of this, and we can bring the logarithm inside the limit. I'm sorry, bring the limit inside the logarithm. So this is going to be e to the limit, bring the limit inside the exponent. Not e to the limit of, as x approaches infinity, of x log of 1 plus 1 over x. So, e to the log of this, and brought the limit inside the exponent. And then the log of this is going to be x times the log of 1 plus 1 over x. So this is like so. Now what happens here? <clears throat> As x approaches infinity here, we get infinity. We get log of 1. Log of 1 is 0, so we get infinity times 0. So we want to rewrite this as e, the limit, as x approaches infinity, of log of 1 plus 1 over x divided by 1 over x. Now as x approaches infinity, this approaches 0 over 0. And so we can use L'Hopital's rule here. This is going to be e to the derivative of the log of 1 plus 1 over x is 1 over 1 plus 1 over x. The limit here now as x approaches infinity. 1 over 1 plus 1 over x times the derivative of, of 1 plus 1 over x, which is minus 1 over x squared divided by the derivative of 1 over x minus 1 over x squared. The minus 1 over x squared can be canceled here. And we then have, as x approaches infinity, this goes to 0. And so this limit is equal. This limit right here is 1. And so we get e to the 1, or e to the limit. Then look at another example. Let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of log x to the 1 over x. What happens here? As x approaches infinity, this approaches infinity. This is, what is the form infinity to the 0. What? 1 over x approaches 0. So we, we can take e to the log of this and bring the limit inside the exponent. So this is e to the limit as x approaches infinity log of 1 over x log x.
as x approaches infinity of 1 over log x times 1 over x. So, okay. This log x clearly approaches infinity, 1 over x approaches infinity, so this limit is going to be equal to 0. Now, we had originally, we had e to this limit, so we're going to get e to the 0, which is 1. minus 1 to the log x power, and the limit as x approaches 1 from the right. What are we looking at here? As x approaches 1 from the right, this approaches 0, log x approaches 0. Well, so we're looking at 0 to the 0, the form 0 to the 0. So you want to take exponent of logarithm of this, so we're going to get e to the logarithm, and bring the limit inside the exponent, so limit logarithm of x minus 1, x minus 1 to the log x power, so this is log x times log x minus 1, and the limit as x approaches 1 from the right. <coughs> okay. Um, what happens here? As x approaches 1, this is 0, this is log of 0, which is infinity. So we want to rewrite this as e, the limit as x approaches 1 from the right, log of x minus 1 over the 1 over log x. In which case we're going to have, as x approaches 1, this is going to be log of 0, which is minus infinity. As x approaches 1, log x approaches 0, so we're going to have infinity here. So we can apply the local tiles rule. This is going to be e to the limit as x approaches 1 from the right. What have we got here? We've got derivative of log of x minus 1 is 1 over x minus 1. For the denominator here, the derivative of 1 over log x. That's log of x to the minus 1 power, so the derivative is going to be minus 1 log of x to the minus 2 times the derivative of log of x, which is 1 over x. E to this limit. Okay, what happens to the limit? Well, we've got x approaches 1 from the right. Bring the 1 over x up here. We're going to have x over x minus 1. We've got a minus sign here from the minus 1. And we've got 1 over log of x squared. So this is going to be log x squared. approaches 1 from the right, the denominator approaches 0, the numerator here approaches 0. We can apply the Opatow's rule one more time here. What are we going to get? The derivative of the denominator is 1. In the numerator here, we've got x times logs x squared. So that's going to be the first times the derivative of the second, which is going to be 2 log x times 1 over x plus the second log x squared as the derivative of the first. Now what happens as x approaches one from the right? Log x is approaches zero. Log x here approaches zero. And with the one over x and the x can be canceled. And so we end up with zero here for this limit, right here, as x approaches one from the right. That's to say, here we've got the limit as x approaches one from the right, and we have e to that. So we have e to the zero, or one. So this limit here of, as x approaches one from the right, x minus one from log x, is e to the zero, or one. Let's take a look at another example here of one of these forms involving all the tiles rule. Let's take a look at the limit as x approaches 0 from the right, 1 plus 2x to the 1 over 3x. All right, what is this, what's the format here? As x approaches 0, this is going to approach 1, and the numerator here is going to approach infinity, so I'm looking at 1 to the infinity. That's the form. We now want to take a look at the logarithm of this. 
is going to be 3. So we want this times 3 here, huh? divided by 3. Now what happens is x approaches 0 from the right. This becomes 1 plus 0. We end up with 2 thirds. So this is going to be equal to e to the 2 thirds. This next one here approaching 2 thirds. Let's look at another. Look at the limit. As x approaches infinity of 1 plus 3x to the 5 over x. What happens here? As x approaches infinity, this approaches infinity to the uh, this 5 over x approaches 0. So it's, it's infinity, this is the form of infinity to the 0 power. Okay? So we can write e to the log of this. Let's say this is going to be e to the log of 1 plus 3x times 5 over x. And we want the limit now as x approaches infinity. The numerator approaches infinity, the denominator approaches infinity. So this is going to be equal to e, phi over tau, so limit as x approaches infinity, 5, the derivative of log of 1 plus 3x is 1 over 1 plus 3x times 3. The derivative of the denominator is 1. So e to this limit. Now, but what happens here now? As x approaches infinity, 1 plus 3x approaches infinity. And so this approaches 0. 5 over, oh, 15 over 1 plus 3x approaches 0. So this approaches e to the 0. Or what? All right. Um, I want to note a couple of things here. If you've got something on the form a to the infinity, right? If a is less than 1, then when you take a, by this is meant the form a to the infinity, the quantity here approaches a and the exponent approaches infinity. If a is less than 1, then raising a small number to a large power, this is going to be, this is going to result in 0, huh? So this form here always has 0 for a limit. Something in the form a to the infinity, if a is greater than 1, if you take a number greater than 1 and raise it to a power, right, a large power, where this approaches some number a greater than 1, then you're going to get infinity for a limit. Right? The thing to note then also is the zero to the infinity, okay, through positive values. That's to see where zero is being approached through positive values. Take zeros to a large, a large uh, something approaching zero to a large power. All right, it's going to just get smaller, and so that we're going to have zero for a limit. So that this form format right here can be just directly evaluated. Similarly for these two, if you know that if a is being, um, if, if you know that a is less than one, or if a is greater. Some additional examples. Okay, we want to take a look at some things that are in the form infinity minus infinity. Here, there's no real guarantee that you can change things over to both Tau's rule or anything else. You really just have to work with them. Um, let's take a look at an example. Let's take a look at the limits as x approaches pi over 2 tangent x minus secant x. So x approaches <coughs> pi over 2. Tangent x approaches infinity. Right. Secant x, which is 1 over cosine x, approaches infinity. It's sine over cosine, so it approaches infinity. And so we're looking at infinity minus infinity. Now, a good rule of thumb is, is to change things involving trig functions to sines and cosines when there's some difficulty and see if it doesn't work easier 
So let's write this as the limit as x approaches pi over 2. Tangent is sine x over cosine x. And secant is 1 over cosine x. So we're looking at sine x minus 1 over cosine x. Right? Lower tiles rule applies here. Sine x approaches 1. So we have 1 minus 1 or 0. Cosine x approaches 0. So we get that this is equal to the limit provided it exists x approaches pi over 2, derivative of sine is cosine, right? minus 1 is 0, derivative of cosine x is minus the sine of x, right? and as x approaches pi over 2, cosine x approaches 0, sine of x approaches 1, and so 0 is this limit. Okay, let's take a look at another here. The limit as um, x approaches 0, uh, let's say cotangent x minus 1 over x. Okay. Again here, let's change this to sines and cosines. So this becomes the limit as x approaches 0. Cosine x over sine x. I'm going to put this 1 over x in here to 2. So if I put x cosine x over x sine x, as cotangent, then 1 over x is, I'm going to have minus sine x here, right? So I have minus 1 over x all together. Now, as x approaches 0, this is 0, approaches 0, this approaches 0, the denominator approaches 0 here, so that we can't apply L'Hopital's rule in this form right here. This is going to be equal to um, the limit x approaches 0, this is a product, so it's the first times derivative of cosine, which is minus sine, plus cosine x, times the derivative of x, which is, which is 1, minus the derivative of sine of x, which is, to say, minus cosine x, huh? over, we've got x sine x here, so the derivative is the first times the derivative of the second, cosine x, plus the second, sine x, times the derivative of the first, which is 1. Huh? This is cosine x minus cosine x. Now as x approaches 0, x sine x, we've got 0 in the derivative. We've got 0 times this plus 0 in the denominator. So the Patel's rule applies again. Right? The limit as x approaches 0 of uh, what? The derivative in the numerator. First, this is minus x times the derivative of sine, which is cosine, plus the second, sine x, um, times the derivative of the first, divided by, what have we got here? x cosine x, so that's the first times the derivative of cosine x is minus the sine, plus the second, cosine x, times the derivative of the first, plus the derivative of the sine, which is cosine x, so we get another cosine x here. So looking at this, what happens here is x approaches 0, this approaches 0, this approaches 0, the denominator this approaches 0, but this approaches 2. So this limit is equal to 0. Right, so cotangent x minus 1 over x approaches 0 as x approaches 0. Right? Let's take a look at one more here. Let's look at the limit as x approaches 2 of 1 over square root x squared minus 4 minus 1 over x minus 2. Okay. Let's make this the limit as x approaches 2 from the right so that this is defined here. Now we're looking at infinity minus infinity. Right. The best bet with this is going to be algebra. What we want to do is we want to write this over a common denominator here. We end up with square root of x squared minus 4. Right? That's actually square root x minus 2 times square root x plus 2. And so we've got, we can write this times square root x minus 2. And that will put square root x minus 2 in the numerator here. And uh, so that puts, that's this part right here, minus, we've got square root x plus 2. x 
minus 2 in factors like so. And this is the limit now as x approaches 2 from the right. That is to say, OK, this x plus 2 factors into here giving us x minus squared, x minus 2 squared. So that makes 1 over x minus 2. OK. Now, the thing to do with this is treat this as a minus b and multiply by a plus b. If we multiply by a plus b, we end up with x minus 2 minus x plus 2. And in the denominator here, we've got this, square root x squared minus 4 times square root x plus 2 uh, times square root x minus 2. And then we've got times square root x minus 2 minus square root x plus 2. And the limit now as x approaches 2 from the right. Now what happens here? x approaches 2 from the right, we've got x minus x, and we've got minus 2, so that the numerator here is minus 4, and the denominator, this approaches 0, 0, and this quantity right here approaches uh, what? 2 minus 2 is 0 plus minus the square root of 4. At any rate, this is a product. The denominator approaches 0 through positive values, and so we get minus 4 over 0 through positive values, or minus infinity for the limits. Okay. Here there was no need to use Lopatel's rule. Um, we just need to work with an algebraically until we can find out what the limit is. Here are cases where you're looking at infinity minus infinity, however, and you can change it around. It just depends on the circumstances. You try what you can here to, to figure out what the limit happens to be. Okay, we want to take a look now at what are called improper integrals. There are essentially two different types of these. Um, the first of these is to find the area under the graph of f of x, where f of x will take the initial here to be greater than or equal to 0, and uh, where the function f of x is not bounded on the interval. Now, sometimes um, if the function is greater than or equal to 0, sometimes this there will be actually a finite amount of area underneath the graph, even though the function is not bounded. Sometimes there will be an infinite amount. Um, we'll see what happens here. Let's take a look at an example. Um, let's look at uh, 1 over square root of x on the interval from 0 to 1. The graph this looks something like this. And so now, the question is, is there any, is there an infinite amount of area underneath here, or is there a finite amount, or what? Can you possibly cover this up with boxes, for example? So that this box has size a half and the a one, and the next one has size a half and a quarter, and so forth? Or is that not possible? Well, in order to get at this, what we want to do is we want to consider um, some epsilon greater than zero, or t greater than zero, and if you find the integral from zero to one, and here we'll put a little asterisk down at the bottom. Sometimes people put a line down at the bottom here to indicate this is not a proper integral at zero. So we're going to define the integral from zero to one of one over square root of x dx be equal to the limit if it exists as t approaches zero from the right of the integral from t to one of, well, in this case, x to the minus one half dx. So we integrate to 1 here, and then we take the limit as t approaches 0 from the right, and that's going to define the uh, improper integral here. Well, what happens here with this? This is equals to, and that integral of x to the 1 half is going to be, x to the minus 1 half is going to be x to the 1 half over 1 half, or 2x to the 1 half. We now want to take the limit as t approaches 0 of this after it's been evaluated from t to 1, which is going to be 1 minus 2 square root t to the limit as t approaches 0 from the right, which is going to be equal to 1, which is going to be equal to 2. 
divided by 1 is 2. to be the limit as t approaches 0 from the left here. We've got integral of x to the minus 2 thirds is x to the minus x to the 1 third over 1 third, so 3x to the 1 third divided divide from minus 1 to t plus the limit as t approaches 0 from the right. We've got 3x to the 1 third evaluated from t to 2. This is going to be 3t to the one third minus the value at, at minus one here, right? Which is going to be plus three. And the limit as t approaches zero from the left of this quantity plus the limit as t approaches zero from the right of at 2, 2 times the cube root of 2, minus 3 cube root of t. This first limit here, this approach is 0, so the first limit is equal to 3. That tells you that this area right here is 3. Yeah? The second limit is 2 cube root of 2, uh, 3 cube root.
out then the integral, and this is improper at 0, integral from 0 to 2 of 1 over x squared dx. minus 1 over 2 minus the value at t which is minus 1 over t so we want now the limit as t approaches the 0 from the right of this as t approaches 0 from the right this is going to be equal to infinity here we've got plus 1 over t so we get infinity so the area in here even though this looks like something this looks very much like for example 1 over square root of x which has finite area general situation here when we're looking at looking at a bounded interval a b. If we, if we take a look at a bounded interval from a to b, we can have a function in here that's unbounded in several ways. For, for example, perhaps it looks something like this. Right? And then uh, maybe it goes like so.
or more of them are minus infinity. But no um, infinity value here, then minus infinity is going to be the integral. Here the total is going to be the integral. Here's going to be infinity, here's going to be minus infinity. If you add plus infinity and minus infinity represented among these numbers here, then there is no integral. Two is an asymptote, and the other 
side here is minus pi over 2. This is our tangent. So we get another pi over 2 here, and so that this is equal to pi. That's the standard uh, pi units, so to speak, of area underneath the graph of 1 over 1 plus x squared between minus infinity and infinity. two points, let's say x1 and x2, where it's not bounded, and we need to pick additional points in here. Let's say a, b, and c, between minus infinity and x1, between x1 and x2, and between c and infinity. So this integral then is going to be equal to the integral from minus infinity to a of this function. Well, this is the improper integral there, plus the integral from a to x1, plus the integral from x1 to b, plus the integral from b to x2, plus the integral from x2 to c, plus the integral from c to infinity. It's possible to add all these up, and that's what's going to be meant by this improper integral. That's to say, if all these are finite, then add the total as the integral. Some are infinite, say plus infinity, right? and no, none of them are positive infinity. Now, some of them are positive infinity, but none of them are negative infinity. Then infinity is going to be the integral. Right? If some are minus infinity and none plus infinity, then minus infinity is going to be the integral. If you've got some plus infinity, sum of minus infinity, then there's going to be no integral. You cannot add plus infinity and minus infinity in this situation here. No integral in that case. Or some of these are plus infinity and some are minus infinity. Otherwise, this is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of a function now, which is not bounded at several places. T approaches infinity, and rather just 
just go to an antiderivative here, understanding that what's next um, is if we take an antiderivative, this is going to be an antiderivative going to be e to the minus 3x over minus 3. And then I write, evaluate this from 0 to infinity. Understanding here now that what's meant by this is you take the value of t and let t approach infinity, subtract from that the value of 0. Okay, so that this is going to be equals to what? As t approaches infinity here, e to the minus 3 to t goes to 0. So it's going to be 0 minus the value of 0. e to the 0 is, is uh, 1. So we've got 1 over minus 3. So we get one third. So the integral from zero to infinity here is one third. Let's look at another. Let's look at the integral from three to infinity. One over x log x dx. Okay. Um, log x is positive for x larger than one. There isn't any real problem with this here. And so. What we want to do is we want to find an antiderivative of 1 over x log x. Well, if we, for an antiderivative of 1 over x log x dx, let u equal to um, log x, and du then is 1 over x dx, and this then becomes integral of 1 over u du. u is log x, du is 1 over x dx. So this is going to be log u. Right? So an antiderivative here now is going to be log of u is log x. So log of log x evaluated from 3 to infinity. Evaluated from 3 to infinity. That's to say, you take the limit as, as t approaches infinity. Let's look at a couple more examples. Say the integral from 2 to infinity x e to the minus x dx. Okay. You need an antiderivative of x e to the minus x um, by parts here, right? If uh, we let f be x and this e to the minus x, this is f, this is g prime. And f prime is 1, and g is e to the minus x over minus 1. Huh? So an antiderivative for this is going to be um, x times e to the minus, minus e to the minus x, minus the antiderivative of the bottom line here. So this is going to be minus, um, minus, and I drew it of e to the minus x, which is going to be e to the minus x over minus 1, so I'll minus again. So this is an antiderivative right here of this. What we want to do is we want to evaluate this from 2 to infinity. That's to say we want it to take the limit as t approaches infinity minus t, e to the minus t, minus e to the minus t. Um, minus, that's the value of t, minus the value of 2. The value of 2 here is minus 2, e to the minus 2, minus e to the minus 2. Okay. What happens here? Well, this is a number. We want to show what this limit is right here. As t approaches infinity, e to the minus t approaches 0. As t approaches infinity, e to the minus t approaches 0, but t approaches 1. So we, what we want here is the limit as t approaches infinity 
of t e to the minus t. Okay? This is going to be equals to e to the minus t over a t over e to the minus t, yeah? And the limit as t approaches infinity. t over e to the t. And the limit as t approaches infinity. By L'Hopital's rule, this is going to be equal to 1 over e to the t. And the limit as t approaches infinity, which is going to be equal to 0. That's e to the t goes to, to infinity faster than t does. So that this quantity right in here is also going to approach 0. And the result is going to be equal to 2 e to the minus 2 plus another e to the minus 2 or 3 e to the minus 2. That's the answer here to this. Now let's look at a couple of others here. How about the antiderivative of, of 1 over x cubed from 0 to 1? It's improper at 0 here right, with respect to x. This is going to be um, the limit as t approaches 0 from the right of what this x to the minus 3, so it's going to be x to the minus 2 over minus 2 evaluated from, from t to 1, which is going to be the limit as t approaches 0 from the right of minus a half minus uh, minus a half over t, t squared. Huh? As t approaches 0 from the right, this is going to approach infinity. Right? And so infinity is going to be the value of this integral. Let's look at the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the minus 1 third dx. Improper at 0. Huh? This is going to be equal to x to the 2 thirds, this is an antiderivative, over 2 thirds. And now what we want to do is we want to evaluate this from t to 1 and take the limit as t approaches 0 from the right. This is going to be equal to um, 1 over 2 thirds, or 3 halves, minus 3 halves, t to the 2 thirds, and the limit here, as t approaches 0 from the right, t to the 2 thirds goes to 0, and so this approaches 2 thirds, and so the, the integral in this case here is 2 thirds. In the previous one it was infinity. Two thirds here. And there are now three additional examples of improper. Error.